turn, if you will, first to Psalm 130. In Psalm 130, beginning in verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. <clears throat> well, when I was in the military, and you had the privilege of doing guard from about midnight on or so, it was extremely easy to look at the east sky and see if it was beginning to get light because that was morning and you'd get off duty. And he uses that kind of an example to show how we're to wait for the Lord. But in our present day, we're so prone to uh, fast food and fast service that if it's not as fast as we think it ought to be, we go somewhere else. Isn't that right, Danny? You remember years ago in Sykeston, we pulled into a place? Years ago. And they were slow in waiting, so we went to another place. And then we went to a third place before we got service. Well, that's the way we are taught in this world today. Just rush and rush and hurry, hurry, and everything's going to be right then. But God teaches us the necessity of learning to wait for him. Look down at the bottom of your page, and I know you can read, but I'm going to read. <clears throat> Remember, the promise is most sure. It shall come when it should be most seasonable and best for thee, and when God sees it most fit. Know how we need to learn to wait. Let's take a look at Habakkuk now and chapter 3, chapter 2 rather. In Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So we see he's saying that the vision, and uh, I'll show you what he means there in just a moment, is for a yet appointed time. Not right now. Appointed time. In this saying, the vision is yet for an appointed time. He's giving promise that there will be whatever this vision is. And he says, it will not speak and will not lie. Though it may seem like it's tarrying to you, wait for it. And so when God gives you a promise, you rest on that promise. I don't care how long. Well, let's turn to the next one, and we'll get to that in a minute. Psalm 123, verse 2. It's important for us to learn to wait upon 
the word of God. When he gives promise, that's sufficient. We rest on the promise. Now listen carefully. We don't rest on the deliverance of that promise. We rest on the promise. Don't care how long it tarries. Your peace and comfort is in that he gave you promise. To quote from Hebrews, faith is the victory. Not getting what you want or what you think you need, but faith. Psalm 123, verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants look under the hands of their masters, the eyes of a maiden under the hand of her mistress. So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy. <clears throat> now, old King David knew a little bit about being a servant and about being a king. And he knew that in this whole scheme of things, that if the male servant wasn't there at that very moment to wait on the need of the master, or if the uh, maiden wasn't there that moment to wait on the mistress, they were going to be dismissed. And uh, so he says, you wait on the Lord until he have mercy. Remember, it'll be when God sees fit. Now, I pulled out of all of this, there's a lot of examples in the scripture, but I pulled one example that I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter 12. And... Um, Samuel told King Saul, you wait on God. And uh, Samuel was late getting there. At least King Saul thought so. And so um, Samuel went ahead and offered a sacrifice. He was not supposed to do this according to the law. That was to be Samuel's job. King Saul was not to do that. But because Samuel was late getting there, at least King Saul thought so, he went ahead and uh, he took that sacrifice. Verse 5. The Lord is witness against you. And his anointed is witness this day that you fought not only in my hand, and etc. But now turn to verse 13. Now therefore behold the king whom you chosen, and behold whom you desired. He's, uh, he's not to be the one. And um, <clears throat> let me see something here just a minute. And uh, God uh, took Saul in all of this nonsense and set him aside from being king. You can read the long story, and we'll not take time to read it, but it's in, in Samuel. But God stripped him of his kingship because he would not wait upon the Lord. Now, there's a lesson in there for you and for me. That when God gives promise, we're to wait on that promise. 
if we don't wait on that promise, he would draw it. He'd take it away. And so you and I need to learn to wait upon the Lord, when, especially when he gives us promise. Turn back to Psalm 130 and verse 5. You wait for the Lord. And the last part of verse 5, in his word do you hope. And so <clears throat> there may be times in your life when you have a need. And you go to God, and he gives you a promise out of his word. But it seems like that promise is long in coming to pass. That promise and the fulfillment of that promise to you is always on God's timing. And he may test you and test you and test you as he holds back in fulfilling his promise to teach you this immense lesson of learning to wait upon the Lord your God. Because, turn to Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 89. Because when God gives promise, folks, that's all you need. Abraham was going to make a sacrifice and to worship God. He said, take your only son, Isaac. So they start going up the mountain. But there's only two going to go up that mountain. That's Abraham and Isaac. He looks at his servants. And there's some horses and etc. that they rode on. He said, y'all watch those. Learn to read the scripture. He looks at him and says, We will return. They get up to the top of the mountain and they've got wood and fire for the sacrifice, but no lamb. Isaac says, Well, what's going on? And uh, Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb. And that's beautiful in the original language. And then uh, God says, take Isaac, your only son, and sacrifice him. So he takes Isaac, lays him up there, gets ready to kill him. Still in his mind, we will return. Hebrews 11 says he received him in a figure. It is by faith he knew that God was going to perform what he said. Didn't make any difference how long it was. Didn't make any difference how close that knife came. He rested on what God said and waited on God. God said, lift your head up. He looked and there's a lamb caught in the brush. He goes and takes that lamb and that's the sacrifice. Well, the lesson there is learn to wait. Don't care how long God will provide. Psalm 89 and verse 33. <clears throat> the last phrase, he will not suffer his faithfulness to fail. Let me have your attention. God in faithfulness gives promises and God will not fail about those promises. He not only will not, he cannot. What God has promised you is as sure as anything has ever been. And this is the one that I wanted to stick it to, 2 Samuel, chapter 23. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
I don't know a whole lot about life, but I do know this, that if a guy's speaking his last words, he's about to die. And in verse 1 of chapter 23, now these be the last words, the dying words of David. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me. He said, God gave me a promise. Verse 3, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel, that's Christ, spake unto me. He that rolleth over men must be just. Verse 4, he be as the light of the morning, talking about Christ. Verse 5, although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, this is my salvation. This is my desire. Although he maketh it not to grow. By that he means he is withholding it for a period of time. The promise is God's. The deliverance <coughs> is God's. Yours is to wait upon that promise. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 13 talks a whole kind of a roll call of faith and says, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received, by that he means the fulfillment of those promises, but having seen them afar off, that is by the eye of faith, were persuaded embraced and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. All of those saints in the Old Testament turn back to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 just for hold your hand in Hebrews we'll be right back there but Habakkuk chapter 2 <coughs> And verse 3. For the vision. That's the promise of the coming of the Messiah. Didn't come during Habakkuk's time. Back to Hebrews 11. Verse 13. These all died in faith. All of the saints in the Old Testament were given a promise that the Christ was to come. Now you go during the time of the coming of Christ into the temple the first time. There's uh, Anna and... Um, forget the prophet's name, but they were waiting until they should see the fulfillment of Israel because God had promised them, you see in the Gospels, that they would not die until they had seen him. These others were not promised that. They knew they were going to die before the Christ came. Didn't make any difference. They still believed the promise. All of that to teach you that as God gives you a promise out of his word, I don't care what else happens, that's going to be. And so in our mind, we go back to Psalm 130, wait, and in or by his word, hope. You hope in the promise he gave because it will come to pass. I read from Thomas Hooker again these two statements at the bottom of your outline. Remember, 
the promise is most sure. It shall come when it is most seasonable, he says, or the proper time. And at that time, it'll be the best for you. In the meantime, he's given you the promise. You rest on that. It'll come when God sees fit. Now the necessity, and in your book, the poor doubting Christian drawn to Christ, and that's what all those initials mean. In that book, Thomas Hooker teaches, you learn to read God's word every day. I don't care how much, but read God's word every day. And out of that, he'll give you promises. And somebody will come along and say, I remember that. It's a promise. There was a time in my life, years ago, when God encouraged me to read four hours out of the Old Testament every morning and four hours out of the New Testament every afternoon. It was between semesters, incidentally, I might add that. I wouldn't have been able to do it while I was going to college, I don't think. But anyway, eight hours a day in the Scripture. When I'm over there, and I bless God for this, it's not me. And verses come into my mind that I read in years gone by. And His Holy Spirit brings it back for use now. Turn to John 16. Verse 13, how be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, that is the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, etc. Now look at 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said, while you're reading the Word. It is Christ himself speaking to you through the word. And as a need comes up in the time of your life, God's Holy Spirit will indeed bring that back to remembrance, give you a promise to hope on. Stay there, verse uh, 5 of Psalm 130. Wait in his word. The end literally should be by Wait by his word. Okay? Don't care how long the promise is coming. I know when he gives you a promise, the fulfillment is not the saint's desire. The promise is. More than that. Any questions? Thanks for your time.